Welcome to Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem, and I'm your host for this program, which is designed to give us all a little bit more insight into affairs in and around our capital and our capital city of Salem, as well as really the state of Oregon. Our guest today is a gentleman who has had many years of service to the state of Oregon, and even though he is supposedly in retirement, has continued in service to our state and our people. I'm talking about Judge Robert Thornton, who has had a distinguished career in the law and in general public service. Welcome to Capital Insight. We're having a, quite a time these days talking about public service and, and uh, keeping people involved in government, and you seem to be the epitome of a, of a person who has dedicated his career to serving the public. I'd like to go back a little bit and ask you a little bit about your, your own personal background. For instance, uh, where are you from? Well, I'm a native of Portland, <coughs> but I was a, a small town lawyer in Tillamook, Oregon when I first started uh, in public service. I represented Tillamook County in the legislature, and then after that I was state attorney general, and after that I was on the Court of Appeals. Well, I'm curious about where you went to school. You're, you're a native Portlander? Native Portlander, and uh, I uh, went to the public schools of, of uh, Portland, and then I uh, entered Stanford University, and I graduated from Stanford University, and after that I entered Oregon Law School. I had two years of my law at the Oregon Law School, and then my final year was at George Washington in Washington, D.C. Now, you also served in the military during World War II. Yes, I was one of those who took ROTC in college, and I got, uh, of course, called about seven months before Pearl Harbor. So I was, I was in the Army for five years. Now, in the Army, you received training in the Japanese language. Yes, that started out, uh, our regiment was sent right after Pearl Harbor, was sent up in the Alaska Defense Command, and so I was assigned as the regimental intelligence officer. So what I did, I felt if we ever to catch a prisoner and I'm the intelligence officer, I should at least be able to ask him his name, rank, and serial number. So I started teaching myself Japanese, and my wife sent me some records, uh, and I used the records and the tapes, and I used to listen to Radio Tokyo quite a bit, and then I got to the point where I could talk a little bit. And then when the, the operations out in Atu and Kiska came about, out in the Aleutians, the uh, Army sent a detachment of Japanese-American young men to uh, be interpreters, and I got their commanding officer to send one over to my tent every night, and they're the ones that really got me to the point where I could talk it. So now, as part of your military career, you were in the Pacific, actually in, in the Aleutians, which is all, if we looked at the map, all off, I say off the tip of Alaska, but they're mm -hmm. really stretched out mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, did you serve for a couple of years there? Yes, I was, in, I was in the Alaska Defense Command for two years, and then I was ordered back to the Army Japanese Language School, and it was then at Fort Snelling, Minnesota. Now, did you receive formal training there in terms of writing Japanese, or have you stayed? Yes, the whole speak? thing. It's, it's a, it was a very intensive course, and it uh, included both the writing and the conversation and the reading. And you study Japanese history and Japanese culture and Japanese military organization, and give you quite a thorough background. And most of the students were Japanese Americans, and they all told there were something like six thousand of Japanese Americans went through, but there were uh, quite a number of, of uh, Caucasians in the in the program as well, but no, nowhere near the number that were in the uh, Japanese American category. Now, after World War II, and you completed your military service, uh, did you go right into the practice of law, or how did that work? Yes, I, I had already been in the practice of law in Tillamook, and I was just getting out of the so-called starvation period when I got called in the service. And then I, when I went back five years later, I started all over again, and I was. Uh, the usual small town practice. I was uh, also city attorney for Tillamook and the cities of Nehalem and Garibaldi. And I, so that's where I was, and for the most part, I guess that's where I started getting into public service because I was involved in the uh, Junior Chamber of Commerce and the various civic activities, Kiwanis, and so on. And then you were called upon to serve in the Oregon legislature. You served, what, one term in the I, House of I Representatives? Served, I served in the House. I represented Tillamook County in the House. And uh, following that, uh, you were convinced to run for Attorney General of Oregon. Yes, uh, this was, the, the race was up and open, and I knew that uh, as a lawyer, I couldn't afford to be in the legislature anymore. That was, it uh, was, 
it's really hard on your practice, and I don't know how you've done it. It's remarkable the way you've kept up both your, your practice and your service in the legislature. So yes, I, uh, I uh, decided that uh, I'd take a chance on the Attorney General's race, and one of those lucky breaks you get maybe once or twice in a lifetime, I got elected. Then you served for three full terms as Attorney General. No, it would be four full terms. Oh, four. Sixteen years, yes. I was Attorney General for, four, for 16 years. Now, following, and, and we can, I guess we can mention at that time, it was a, it's a partisan office. You were a Democrat. That's, that's correct. And uh, then after that, you were appointed to the Court of Appeals, the newly formed? No, I ran for the Court of Appeals. I, I, I ran from scratch for the Court of Appeals and was elected. So you're one of the unusual judges who first got on through pure election. You know, the statistics show that 82% of our judges first get on the bench by appointment. I think that's right, yes. Uh, so did you have, uh, was it a primary type race for, for an open seat? Yes, or? yes that, it wasn't an open seat. It was uh, uh, running against an incumbent who had just been appointed by uh, Governor McCall. You took him on and you got it. Yes, yes I did. I was very fortunate and of course it uh, gave me an insight into the judicial system where I'd just been an outsider and an observer. Now, how many years did you serve as a, as a full-time active judge on the Court of Appeals? That'd be 12 years, two terms. So we've got you serving five years in the Army, and then two years in the House, and 16 years as Attorney General, and then 12 years as a judge. That adds it up, yeah. Well, uh, quite, quite a career in public service, not, not including city attorney and, of course, all of your private practice. When you shifted from the Court of Appeals, though, you really didn't seem to retire. You seemed to have dived into a variety of other activities. And this gets back to why we were talking a lot about the Japanese language. You seem to have developed and maintained quite an interest in uh, American-Japanese relations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, this, of course, comes first of all from my service in the military and having gone through that intensive course in the Japanese language and culture and history and so on. So it was a rather natural thing, but uh, just before I went on the bench, uh, I was invited to be a guest professor in a Japanese university. And it was during that time that uh, they had the uh, Kent State riots against the Vietnam War by the students and so forth at Kent State, Ohio. And uh, the, uh, somebody started throwing rocks at the National Guardsmen who were there uh, more or less controlling the riot, and uh, one thing led to another, and uh, the National Guardsmen fired on these demonstrators, thinking they were being attacked, and they killed about five or six students. And it was, I saw the Japanese riot police in action, and I could see that they would, were handling larger and more violent riots without killing people. So I did a study, and I wrote an article for the International Police Journal on the techniques and tactics of the Japanese riot control police. And so this led to a later one I did on the selection and training of judges in Japan. And I found in that case that I think our system of selecting and training judges was better than the Japanese. I like it better. And then, of course, this one was on the whole picture of crime control in Japan, comparing it here. And it's based using the sister cities of Salem, Oregon, and Kawagoi, Japan, as uh, comparative case studies. And I went through the policing methods, the citizen involvement, what the citizens do in the two cultures in the way of the crime control, uh, the role of the schools, what they do in, in the school system in terms of crime prevention education, and the two correctional systems. And I uh, think perhaps of all these areas covered, the one that has the greatest potential for improvement in our correction system is the Japanese correction system. Now this has led to, um, I'll call it our professional association. Uh, uh, during the session, you and I have worked together uh, on, on trying to change our statutes on putting prisoners to work. But before we get on to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, uh, the whole system of crime prevention. And you were active in that issue in 1989, as I recall. That's right. Can you That's tell right. us about that? Well, I can say that that, uh, to return the compliment that uh, you were the one that uh, spearheaded the crime prevention bill in the legislature in the 89 session and you were responsible for putting a, a transferring the, uh, the uh, crime prevention resource center from the uh, executive department over to the police academy. This is what you did, I've, uh, this is what you did in the uh, 91 session. 
Uh, I said 89, but at the 91 session. No, it was the 91 where you got it rem uh, transferred to the police academy and where it's really moving, and it wasn't moving in the executive department. Well, with that, but it did. It, you initiated this in '89. Yes, that's I right. I wrote. I wrote the bills, and then we uh, we followed through later yes. on. Um, I always believe in following through on those. And issues. In, in that same connection, I, I should mention that uh, Representative Gene uh, Durfler was co-sponsor with you, and so we had, fortunately, a bipartisan sponsorship. Well, as we worked on those issues, you pointed out to me that the as you've commented here today, that there's a lot to be desired in our correction system and how we deal with crime. Before we get into that, though, I'll mention to our audience that you are with us on Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem. If you ever have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to write to me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capital, Salem, Oregon, 97310. Our guest today is a distinguished gentleman who has served our nation both in the military and uh, as a lawyer and has served our state as a lawyer and as a city attorney, as a legislator, as a judge, as attorney general, you name it, he seems to have been doing it. Uh, and although he pretends to be retired, he's active now on uh, prison issues. And that's what we're about to talk about, which, which is corrections and, and uh, prison industries. Can you tell us a little bit about how the system works in Japan? Yes, the uh, first, first thing that's important to note is that it's a national prison system. It's a national police system. Uh, there are no city police, there are no county police, there are no state police. They're all part of a national police system. And this is true as to uh, uh, the prison system. The thing that's important to note about the Japanese prison system is that they do a better job of keeping all their inmates busy. You never see an idle prisoner in a Japanese prison. They're all working and they're uh, working on in little workshops that produce and manufacture uh, quality goods. They're sold on the open market and the profits uh, from those sales are used to help pay the cost of running the prisons. You never see any smoking in a Japanese prison. You never see any talking while they're working. They're, they're talking is prohibited. And it's much more military than ours, and much more disciplinary, and there's a lot of physical activity uh, in the thing. But the thing that is particularly valuable in the Japanese system is that they've persuaded major manufacturing corporations to set up training programs inside the prison. Uh, 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 and when those prisoners get out, if they've made a good record in that training program, they can get a job with that particular manufacturing company on the outside, and this uh, uh, accounts for the fact that their recidivism rate is about 20 percent, 20 points less, 20 uh, percent less than ours. They do have recidivism, but that, it's, that recidivism for our, our audiences it means the repeat offense rate. The repeat the the, the so-called revolving door proposition, where they're in and out, and this is the problem in our system: is that these inmates, uh, for the most part, they're. Uh, out of 6,500 inmates in the Oregon correctional system, less than uh, 500 are in what you'd call real world jobs. We do have prison industries, but it's nowhere near the extent it is in Japan and in, in number of inmates involved. And, and of course, they are not uh, uh, contributing uh, to the cost of operating as they do in Japan. In Japan, our, uh, uh, overall, there are about over $14 million turned over annually from the sale of these goods turned over to the cost of running the prison. So the prisoners are really working as we're in attempting to do in this approach that uh, you're going to talk about next. Well, that's a nice cue because mm -hmm. we, uh, we have been talking and we've put together. Well, first of all, let's talk about the session because we put together a bill to reform prison industries and uh, put all the prisoners to work. And we ran into uh, a very interesting scenario where there's some very strong special interests who are not interested in seeing inmates work, not because they're pro-crime or anything like that, but because they're fearful of competition. They don't want inmates doing government work. They don't want inmates outside doing private sector work. Um, and, and there are people in the private sector who don't want inmates working because they don't want competition from that in terms of uh, different activities. And my favorite example is the Oregon Health Sciences University, 
which has to contract with uh, a private laundry service in Portland, despite the fact that the state prison laundry in Salem uh, is fairly modern and is fully capable of handling all of the laundry needs of Oregon Health Sciences University. But they can't contract with the state prison because of all the, the limitations that are placed on prison industries. And it's, it's, it's not just one special interest, there's several. And they get active enough during the political process to throw up all kinds of questions and problems when you try to put a bill together. And uh, we know that the House leadership was somewhat supportive of us in trying to put together a bill. We went through several hearings. But every time we seemed to solve one problem, another special interest popped up to throw up another roadblock. And after a while, we have, by the end of the session, we realized that if we really want to do the job, maybe we ought to turn to the people and just say, let's do it. Let's do it 100%. And this is the same thing that happened in California. In California, they had a provision prohibiting uh, prison industry competition and so forth. And it, it was in the state constitution. And there, uh, when they couldn't get through the legislature, Governor Duke Majin said, all right, we're going to initiate this. And they put it on petitions, and they received over, over one million signatures on those petitions, and it was passed very comfortably by the uh, uh, people of California, the voters, in 1990. And now they're starting to convert their prison system uh, to That's the system right. that puts the inmates to, to work. To do, do things to help them contribute to the cost of operating the prisons. Well, now what we've put together, and we have filed this, uh, it's an initiative that's on file with the Secretary of State. The petitions as we speak are still being certified and will soon be processed uh, so that we can circulate them for signatures. Uh, we call it the Prison Reform uh, and Work Act of 1994, as I mm -hmm. recall. Yeah, Prison Reform and Inmate Work. And Inmate Work Act. And uh, you were a key person in coming up with the concepts behind this. Would you like to talk a little bit about what, what we're doing with that? Yes, this is a, uh, an, a, an effort to let the people decide whether or not we're going to change Oregon's policy and, and eliminate uh, these antiquated provisions that are at the present time hamstringing prison industry. Problem, problem is that it's, it's more than just uh, having them help pay their board and room and so on. It's a matter of whether or not you turn a person out without any job skills or whether you put a person out to, from the prison that has a marketable job skill. And it's, I don't think it, it makes sense to turn people out with no marketable job skill and accept them, accept them to avoid getting back into crime again. So it, this is a, an anti-crime measure, too. Now, one of the key elements of a work program, I suppose, is that it's, it, we require, this is, we should mention, this is an amendment to the Constitution, so it mm -hmm. can't be fooled around with lightly. It would take another vote of the people to undo it, mm -hmm. assuming it passes in November. Um, but the, the measure says that the uh, state and local governments will not pass any restrictions on uh, the capability to put all inmates to work full time, and it puts the responsibility on the director of the state correction system to implement a, a work and a training program. We recognize that you need to train some of these folks to do the jobs they're doing, and as you mentioned, that also provides them with some skills to take to the outside world. Sooner or later, they're going to be released, and we need to make sure that if they're going to be released, there's some opportunity for them to go straight by trying to get a job. Mm -hmm. But one of the most basic things that struck me about this is the work ethic, the idea that uh, the inmates need to know that day in and day out, the rest of us folks who support them right now have to work to earn a living, and they're going to have to do the same thing to get into the routine of doing something and developing a sense of reward even for a job that's been completed and well done. But as we built from that, we also talked about the notion of uh, what can be done with the, with the money that may be earned from things that the inmates produce. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yes, this, this would provide a provision that the, the money uh, that they earn is subject to taxation, it's subject to uh, payment of their dependents, and it also covers a requirement that they pay, pay taxes like the rest of us do. And incidentally, the cost of maintaining and guarding a prisoner in the Oregon system today is now at 18000 a year, which is uh, more than tuition at uh, a university here in Oregon. So it's very, very expensive, and it's going to get more expensive. It's now up, I think, to uh, 26,000 a year in California and about 23,000 in the state of Washington. And it's bound to go up like everything else. So as we, as we wrote this, we put in a provision for paying for your own support in the mm -hmm. prison, 
uh, paying for support of immediate family and the hope that some of those folks who are on welfare who have, because their uh, wage earner is in prison, will be able to be supported instead by the person in prison. Uh, we provide for restitution to victims from the money that's earned. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the establishment of a general victims uh, fund, which money can go into also because there may be times when uh, uh, the perpetrator is never caught and so mm -hmm. direct restitution can't be provided, but this would provide for some of the money to go into a fund to help all victims of crime. Uh, we also talk about uh, allowing some amount to be used for payment of costs of, con of the whole court, court process mm -hmm. that led to conviction. Um, with all of that, uh, it seems that uh, we've put together a package where it's not only good for the inmate in the sense of developing a work ethic and getting some training, it's good for our system in terms of compensation, but we're also talking about compensating the victims of crime through the work of the inmates, which seems to me to be a, a real sense of justice that's been built into this. As we deal with the politics of this, though, and, and try to get signatures on the petitions and, and get it passed, do you see some problems out there in terms of people misinterpreting this or, or misunderstanding what it's all about? Well, this is, of course, a, a, pro a problem that uh, there's going to be complaints, as there has been in the past, that this is unfair competition. But the trend nationally is to move in this direction, to increase uh, productive work inside the prisons and, and stop this business of idleness. For example, if you go out here to, uh, say, the Oregon State Penitentiary on an average day that it isn't raining, uh, you'll see maybe six or eight hundred inmates milling around in the exercise yard, talking, some of them may be pumping iron, as they say, but uh, uh, for the most part they're just talking. And you go into the cell blocks, uh, the, uh, they're either watching TV or they're uh, involved in uh, uh, some type of uh, relaxation like uh, resting on their bunks. And these people want to work for the most part. And of course, some of them are not trainable, but uh, by and large, you're going to uh, uh, provide some adequate uh, uh, experience, work experience, and uh, keep them busy. And of course, uh, there's an element of security in this thing, too, because the idleness is productive of problems inside the prison. If they've got nothing to do, they can start planning a riot or an mm -hmm. escape. That's correct. That's right. this, this is a very important feature, and this is why they criticize them for watching TV. That is actually a security device. Um, Trying to keep them occupied doing keep something. Keep them occupied. But they should be working. They should be working. It's good for the state, and it's good for them, too. Well, as we continue to push this initiative, are we... A, I guess we need to get the message out, too, that this business about competition, we're only talking right now about 6,500 inmates. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's not that big a shift in Oregon's workforce, and we're also talking about putting inmates to work on jobs that many other people aren't willing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, one example I like to use is Nike builds all of its shoes in China because the, that's where the, the labor rates are really low. Uh, because we don't require that minimum wage or anything else be paid, in fact, we exempt uh, all of these inmates from paying minimum, uh, receiving minimum wage, so they may only be paid five dollars a day, for example. Um, there's a provision there that would allow us to say, build a factory within the prison walls, and say, mm -hmm. get, convince Nike to build a shoe factory. Now, I have, we haven't talked to them, I'm just using them as a makeup example, but uh, if they're paying five dollars a day for laborers in China to build shoes, let them pay five dollars a day here. We're putting the inmates to work and we're keeping a little bit of money at home. That's the kind of thing that could be done where you're not really very, very hurting good point. industry. Very good point. The other side of this has to do with state projects. There are a lot of things that we may not be able to do with shortages of funds, but if we could put inmates to work on those projects, uh, if, we, if, if we find ourselves short of state workers, we could put inmates out there as, uh, as, as trainees who are doing some of the work that our state workers or local or mm -hmm. county city workers do. It could even be litter cleanup, going out and cleaning up the creeks. Uh, you name it, mm -hmm. it seems to me that there'd be some opportunity to put people to work. Do they do that kind of thing in Japan with the prison inmates? Do they send them out for community service? Oh, yes. Service? Oh, yes. They send them out uh, not only for uh, uh, public work, but they also send them out there for, uh, uh, to work uh, on shipyards and so forth in the commercial field. H heavy duty work like that? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But the uh, the important thing is in, in Japan is that you, uh, everybody's working. There's, there's no idleness, and uh, it's, it's a much more uh, a military and business-like atmosphere. 
I'm going to pause for a moment and mention to our audience that you're with us on Capital Insight. I'm State Representative Kevin Mannix from Salem. I'm your host for this program. And our guest today is Judge Robert Thornton, a senior judge uh, from the Court of Appeals, also served as Attorney General of Oregon for four terms, also a member of the Oregon House of Representatives. And uh, he's been a lawyer in private practice. He's been a city attorney. Uh, he seems to have covered the whole range besides service in the U.S. military during World War II. If you ever have any questions or concerns, feel free to write to me at Capital Insight, H395, State Capitol, Salem, Oregon, 97310. Judge, we only have about four minutes left, and I thought I might shift a little bit to, to the personal side, just as we wrap things up. Um, I, I, I'm amazed at your amount of activity uh, on these uh, crime reform issues and prison reform issues, and how do you do it? Well, I know it's just a matter of interest, and uh, I feel that uh, I have had this experience, and much of it's been paid for by the federal government and by the state government in forms of, of salary, and it's just something that I can contribute, and I, I, I feel that a person is never too old to make some small contribution. I should mention, Kevin, that uh, this was a four-year study comparing the crime prevention, crime control measures in the two countries. And uh, we wrote a report. The report was purchased by a New York publishing house. And it's out in the paperback now at the present time. And it's uh, sold nationally uh, close to 2,000 copies. And it's also for sale in the Salem bookstores. OK. Little, what's, little give, us the name, <laughs> give us the name of the book. Yeah, the book is called Preventing Crime in America and Japan, a Comparative Study. And is it available at most Salem bookstores? Yes. Yes, you can, you can get it in most Salem bookstores. And if, if anyone contacts you, will you autograph a copy? I will autograph it at no extra charge. Very good, very good. Now, the reason I asked, how do you do it? I mean, you, you still go out and you exercise regularly. What kind of exercise program? Well, I'm a, I'm a lap swimmer. I have a, a quite a bit of problem with arthritis, particularly in one foot, and I can't uh, uh, hike to mount too much anymore, but I can swim. And so I swim about uh, half a mile three times a week down at the YMCA. Wow. I've been doing that forever. Well, you're, you're, you're a, a walking, talking example of what fitness is all about, I think. Well, I, I think it helps when you're in any kind of a pressure job like you are. And you remember I asked you if you were taking some physical exercise a lot because it, it's, I think it's an absolute necessity if you're in a pressure job. Well, I'll, I'll, I am following your advice, and I am getting exercise. Let me, let me ask you about one more thing. We only have a couple of minutes left, and that has to do with RICO, which is the uh, racketeering law. Can you tell us a little bit about a proposal you've put together, which I'll be sponsoring as a Yes, there's a, uh, there's, there's a uh, law on the books that's been there for quite a number of years called RICO, and that stands for uh, Racketeer Influence uh, Criminal Organizations, RICO, R-I-C-O. And this uh, would be an amendment and would uh, prohibit violent criminal organizations and prohibit membership in violent criminal organizations. And this would deal, of course, uh, with the gang problem. And it's by now being scrutinized some, by an expert prosecutor, an expert ex-prosecutor, and also uh, by police agencies to see what they think of the thing. And then uh, you and I have discussed it, and uh, I have... Uh, uh, done a rough draft on the thing, and so we hope that it, uh, some form of uh, uh, RICO amendment bill will be ready for the coming legislature. Very well. Well, there you have it, folks. Some of us are out there active on the anti-crime front, and, uh, and you don't have to be young to be active. Judge Thornton, and I say that in a very friendly way, has, has shown that to us and uh, is working with us to fight gang warfare, to fight gangs, and to make prisoners work in our institutions. Thank you for joining us on Capital Insight, and to our audience, thank you for joining us. Take care.